What you're about to see is incredibly dangerous. You should definitely try this at home. I'm going to show you some interesting contraptions I built while reverse engineering this smart meter. I even made fuming nitric acid in my garage so we could look inside some secret microchips the manufacturer doesn't want us to know about. I've 3D printed an open source, fully automated platform for my microscope so I can accurately position and view the tiny silicon wafers I extracted. Finally, I'll show you how I capture RF signals for analysis and some interesting things I discover hidden inside this meter. I'll also be spraying acid on random things, just to see what happens. When you're reverse engineering a device, it's helpful to have more than one. Destroying some of them is part of the process, so if you only have one, it makes it a bit more difficult to be as aggressive as I will in this video. The first step to reverse engineering anything is to open it up and see what's inside. The first part of this meter is easy to access, but this part here appears to be permanently glued or ultrasonically welded. With a slightly oversized drill bit, it's easy to remove this part. Of course, now we can't put it back together without someone noticing we were here. Perhaps that's part of the design. It's quite interesting comparing meters from different manufacturers. This iTron meter has no screws and feels like it was built with high volume manufacturing in mind. Taking pictures of all the parts and documenting your work is critical to making forward progress. In the beginning, it's easy to keep everything straight in your head, but as time goes on and you try various ways to hack into any device, you'll soon forget what you tried and what the outcome was. As slow as documenting can feel, it's always faster in the long run. Take for instance the parts on this board. I can't find a single data sheet online for any of these. Normally, when you search for a part number online, you get a specification sheet and documentation telling you how the part works. But sometimes a company will get a custom part made or design one themselves. This is known as an ASIC, short for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. But how do I learn how to design a chip and will it make me a better person? Then the answer is to check out my Zero to ASIC course, where I've helped hundreds of people like you to design their own chips, and yes, you'll be the best person ever. In those cases, nothing has to be shared online. This seems like one of those times, so we're gonna need some acid. Remind me not to spill this stuff. You see, in order to dig a bit deeper, we need to take a look at the silicon inside the microchip. This will let us see if it's just a relabeled part or if it's really something custom and what it might do. Sometimes, in the case of this water meter I took apart, the unknown part is just a relabeled component, like slapping a different name over the top of a product. I found this out by using nitric acid to dissolve the epoxy case enclosing the microchip. This is known as decapping. This part was just a Texas Instruments CC1100 transceiver chip that was branded something different when sold to this customer. Now, nitric acid can be purchased from various sources at different strengths. A few years ago, I was able to get 70% concentrated acid from a seller on eBay. This seems to have been killed because there are no more acid sellers on there. What I actually want, though, is over 90% concentrated, also known as fuming nitric acid. To get that, I'm building this garage chemistry setup which will allow me to mix sulfuric acid and potassium nitrate. When those two chemicals are mixed and heated up, they react to produce nitric acid and potassium bisulfate. 
Pure nitric acid boils at 83 degrees Celsius, while the potassium bisulfate doesn't. So by heating up the mixture, causing the nitric acid to vaporize, we can distill it through this liquid-cooled apparatus called a condenser. The result is nitric acid slowly dripping out of the end into this beaker. Mmm, acid. You only need to shop for fuming nitric acid online for a little while to know it's incredibly expensive, even in small quantities. Literally all this glassware was the cost of one small purchase of fuming nitric acid. You know the old saying, teach a man to fish and he'll have acid for life. Now it's called fuming nitric acid because when I blow some air on it through this tube, it fumes. This stuff is the real deal. It'll eat through a microchip package, no problem. It's also handy for reverse engineering because the more concentrated nitric acid is, the less likely it is to attack metals, like the tiny wires used to connect the bond pads from the silicon to the lead frame. This is good if you plan to power on the chip after decapping to directly probe the silicon. At this rate, I'm not going to have any acid left for decapping. If only I had an acid machine. The phrase, don't try this at home, was basically what I used as a kid to drive everything I tried at home. Obviously, you need to research how to do it safely on your own. So you can live to perform more experiments. If you want a deeper dive into how I built this and what I learned along the way, check out the nitric acid post on my Patreon. I want to look at the silicon inside these unknown microchips, so let's give them an acid bath. If we heat the nitric acid at the same time, it will accelerate this reaction. As the acid reacts, it eventually is no longer effective and must be rinsed off using acetone. I'm rinsing into this bowl, which also has baking soda in it, to help neutralize the acid. We keep repeating this acid rinse cycle until we get to the silicon. Now that we've gained access, we can clean it with some isopropyl alcohol and an ultrasonic bath. This is like a massage in a day spa after spending the morning drowning in a bath of acid. Now let's head inside and take a look at these under a microscope. This is an Amscope metallurgical microscope, but it didn't show up this way with this cool automated platform. This is what it looks like when you buy it with the manual stage. It's capable of transmissive and reflective microscopy, which means it can shine light up through a slide to look at the transparent material or down through the objective to illuminate something opaque. Let's remove this manual stage and install the automated delta stage for finer control and the ability to create large stitched images of our microchips. With this, I can take a ton of super close up pictures and then use some software to stitch all of them together and create one mega image. The delta stage is made by Open Flexure and it's open source. You can 3D print one of your own. Plans are available complete with software to control them using low-cost parts like the Raspberry Pi and an Arduino microcontroller which drives the motors. Since I am only using the stage under my own microscope, I had to make some changes to how I control it. You can check out a more detailed video on how I built, calibrated, and controlled the stage on my Patreon. Now let's put this microchip on there, move it around, and see what we can find. At first, I'm just looking for any identifying marks that could help me determine who manufactured it and ideally a part number. Information like this is generally placed on the silicon if you look around. By sending coordinates to the stage, I'm able to tell it where on the XY plane I want it to move and then control the Z axis, which is up and down, to focus it. I don't have to physically touch the microscope at all. Reverse engineering is about digging to see what you find and then using those clues to inform where you dig next. It's rare that I find a smoking gun, 
but with enough clues and detective work, it's possible to find out a lot about a device that the manufacturer might want to keep secret. If you want to check out more silicon images, you can visit John McMaster's site for some very detailed, high-resolution views of microchips. The problem we have when doing things like this is the need for a bigger reaction each time. I mean, when does it end? That's a trick question. There is no end. Now let's take a break from the microscope to check out some security measures used to ensure the integrity of the meter. When they install a smart meter on your house, they don't want you removing it or tampering with it. The first line of defense are these little security tags they place on the metal ring that goes around the meter. They're one-time use, which means you can't remove them without cutting the wire, which makes it obvious to the power company the next time they pay you a visit. They also have a serial number on them that's likely associated with your meter and their database in case you try to get crafty and replace it. Now with old mechanical meters, if you manage to find a way around that security tag, you could remove the meter, take it apart, and the power company would never know. There's no logic inside, it's all mechanical components, and unless they hit a trip wire of some kind, all they could do is replace it if they suspect something is wrong. Smart meters are different though. Getting that tag off is just the first step. Inside, they have ways of recording the events that took place during their removal. Since most transmit data wirelessly back to the power company, they can report when they lose power immediately. If no one around you lost power, then it's clear something happened to that individual meter like being removed. They also have a vibration sensor which detects any shaking. If it detects shaking with a power loss, it can save that data internally as a tamper event and send it back wirelessly at the same time to alert the power company something fishy might have happened. Looking inside, it's a rather simple design. Just a little metal ball that causes light to be blocked. This results in a changing voltage at the output the smart meter can detect. Now, nothing is impossible to defeat. What if the power goes out to your whole neighborhood, or even city, for an extended period of time? This device is a capacitor, and it stores energy that can be used to run the meter for a while in the event of a power loss. The curve on this oscilloscope shows you how long it takes to charge up when power is applied and drain after the power is removed. Once that capacitor is drained, the meter can no longer function, which means even if you shake it, it can't record that event to memory. It basically never happened. Of course, you have to put it back before power comes back on or you'll shake it while installing, and the jig is up. Let's take a look at the radio frequency transmissions that are coming from this meter. Here, I have the smart meter set up next to a software-defined radio and a power supply. The power supply takes the 120 volts coming in from the wall and steps it up to 240 for the meter. The software-defined radio will let me listen to any signals being transmitted from 902 to 928 MHz, which is a license-free band in the United States. This means anyone with an FCC-certified device can transmit here for free. There are other bands where a license is required to transmit, such as the 144 to 148 MHz amateur radio band or the 800 MHz cellular phone band. The amateur radio band just requires you pass a test. 
but cell phone bands cost billions of dollars to acquire the rights to use. Let's watch this waterfall and see what happens when we power it on. Those little blips are the smart meter sending a signal, trying to report information back to the power company. One of the really cool things about software-defined radio is the ability to capture signals and then analyze them later. I can simply play back the recordings over and over. Enhance. 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 Just print the damn thing! This can be very handy if you park somewhere to receive data, verify you are capturing clean signals, save them, and drive away. You're free to analyze them in the comfort of your home with a beverage of your choice. Until next time, thanks for watching.